Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled More Than What You Eat, the Regulation of Metabolic Health and Aging by Diet Composition and Activity. Uh, featuring du Dr. Dudley Lamming, Associate Professor in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Medicine. Today's webinar has been sponsored by Columbus Instruments, so a huge thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. And I'm now very pleased to welcome Dudley to the floor. And Dudley, take it away whenever you're ready. What should I eat? This is a question that we ask ourselves every day, usually multiple times a day. And as noted author, food author Michael Pollan said, we are faced with what's called the omnivore's dilemma. And we can choose between large different types of foods. And the different types of foods that we choose all have different properties. And some might be healthier than others. When asked what we should be eating, Michael Pollan said, first of all, that we should eat not too much. And this has been known to scientists for about 100 years now. So calorie restriction, a state where in animals or even people, um, the number of calories is reduced by somewhere between 20 to 40 percent usually, um, has major health benefits. Um, here uh, we're showing uh, this in mice, here in non-human primates. And you can see that in both cases, as we move from eating an ad libitum diet, where animals eat as much as they want, to restricted diets, where the calories are restricted, um, there's a major increase in lifespan. And importantly, this is not just related to lifespan. It also reflects health span. So animals that are calorie restricted tend to have reduced rates of many age-related diseases, including car cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and in appropriate models, even Alzheimer's disease. But restricting calories is very difficult. Most humans aren't capable of restricting calories for a prolonged period of time. You can see that in our society overall in the United States, about 70% of people are now either overweight or obese. And cutting calories even more uh, than, than you know, needed to maintain a healthy weight would be very difficult. So we've started thinking about what makes up a meal. And when we think about a meal, a meal is usually made up of three major macronutrient categories, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. When, for a number of years now, people have suggested modifying what our diet is in order to improve our health and potentially even our longevity. A long time ago now, um, after World War II, there's a lot of focus on fats. And in particular, saturated fats were thought to be particularly bad for the cardiovascular system, promote atherosclerosis. For the last 20 years or so, people have focused on carbohydrates as really um, something that's driving obesity and diabetes um, around the globe. In all of this, dietary protein has been thought to be relatively neutral. Protein promotes satiety, which is good, um, and it displaces calories from fat and carbohydrates. So there's been a lot of advice uh, saying that we should eat more protein and even diet, uh, diets that have been proposed that are really high protein diets. But is more protein really good for us? The answer from the field of nutritional epidemiology seems to be no. And these types of studies are very hard to conduct, but they have some real um, strengths, such as they're conducted in people in the real world, and they can follow people over really long periods of time. And studies like NHANES have shown that low protein diets are actually associated with decreased rates of cancer, mortality, and other diseases such as diabetes. That diabetes signal in particular tends to show up in a lot of studies. This was a prospective cohort study in Europe where they followed 40,000 people for a decade. And the people who are eating in the highest quartile protein consumption had about twice the risk of developing diabetes as those in the lowest quartile. And many other studies have linked high protein diets to cardiovascular disease, particularly if people are also having diabetes um, or insulin resistance. Now, we've decided that um, we want to really dig in uh, to this protein. We, we, for the last decade now, we've been working on this. And I don't have time uh, to recap all the different studies that we and other labs around the world um, have done over the past 10 years. But basically what we found is that both mice and humans um, react to protein restriction 
um, where we restrict the amount of dietary protein by about 50 to 70 percent um, with improved metabolic health. In two different human trials, um, it was shown that these are associated with decreased rates of weight and adiposity and improvements in glucose homeostasis. One study even showed improvement in insulin sensitivity. And we can reproduce these in mice very reliably. Now, you might ask, since these are things that are happening in humans, why should we worry about mice? And mice have some major advantages um, as composed to humans. So first of all, mice eat exactly what we feed them. There's no concern about people intentionally or unintentionally not reporting some of the food that they might eat, some of the meals that they might eat, um, cheating on their diet, if you will. We can measure exactly how much they eat. Even for humans, humans often eat part of a meal. They might leave some behind. How do you judge exactly how many calories and what types of calories those are? When mice, in case of mice, it's very easy because we're controlling what they eat and we can measure it directly. Um, we can control diet composition precisely. And this is really important because in mice, we can change just one or two things at a time. Where in humans, if you take humans who are eating a you know, largely meat-based diet that are sort of on, on a standard American diet, you put them on a protein-restricted diet, in order to keep that palatable, you're changing a lot of things about what they're eating. They're not just eating less protein, they're eating different types of protein, maybe more leafy greens, maybe more fish, maybe different oils. And we can also do a lot more tests um, because we have access to animals 24-7. Um, we don't have to schedule people to come in out of at a time where you and they are both free and they have a limited amount of time and patience um, to work with them. So today I'm going to tell you two stories. And the first um, is something that we've sort of really thought about for a long time now. And fundamentally, the question is, why are people who consume high protein diets sometimes metabolically healthy? This really relates to people who are athletes. So athletes eat a lot of protein. Um, you probably know some athletes in your life that consume either um, protein supplements or maybe branched chain amino acid supplements. Those are a particular um, subtype of the components of dietary protein. Um, and a number of other groups do as well. Um, not just endurance athletes, also people who are weight training, people who are trying to build up really big muscles for aesthetic reasons or weightlifting competitions. So there's a large number of people who eat a lot of protein um, and are metabolically healthy. And we've been really interested in trying to figure out why that is. And we finally came up with a way of doing that um, just a couple of years ago. Um, one of our collaborators came up with a great way to um, perform exercise studies in mice. And this is a mouse model of resistance exercise training. So the mice pull in either an unladen cart, so just an empty cart that's not heavy, or they pull a cart in which an increasing amount of uh, weights can be loaded onto it. And so um, as they um, exercise, they walk down a track, pulling this cart behind them, and we add more and more weight until um, they can't pull the cart anymore. And the thing that's really fascinating is just like people would, these animals get much, much stronger um, during the results of a training. And so we tested this in young C57 black 6J males, this is an inbred strain of mice, we fed them either a low protein diet where 7% of the calories came from protein or a high protein diet where 36% of the calories came from protein. Now, looking at body weight, um, what you could see is that um, we really expected that high protein diets would um, promote weight gain. And this is something that we've seen in tons of different studies as well as in, in our human trials and is implied in our human um, uh, epidemiology studies that, that people have performed as well by other groups. And you can see that these the mice that gained the most weight over time were those on the high protein diet, not the ones on the low protein diet. And this is true even though these diets are exactly matched for calorie content, right? So they're is actually isocaloric diets, um, but if they're eating a high protein diet, they gain a lot more weight. You can see that quantified at the end of this uh, weight uh, training uh, period here. Um, they have gained about twice the amount of weight as um, weight training mice and much more weight than low protein diet fed mice. So um, we see this protection, if you will, from weight gain in the mice that are undergoing resistance training. This is almost all fat mass. 
And so you can see that all three of these groups, um, either low protein, low protein plus weight training, high protein plus weight training, all have very similar amounts of adipose tissue. But there's a huge amount of increase in fat mass in the mice eating a high protein diet that are sedentary. Now, food consumption between these groups is actually pretty similar. Um, there's a consistent trend towards high protein fed mice to actually eat a little bit less. Because as you may remember that I mentioned during the introduction, dietary protein promotes satiety. And so this is measured over the course of um, a 24 hour period in metabolic chambers by Columbus Instruments. Um, and these chambers allow us to measure multiple parameters related to energy balance at the same time. Another parameter that we can measure is activity. So low protein diet fed mice do move more uh, than high protein diet fed mice. Um, but all these other three groups are, are pretty much similar. And that's limited actually towards the period during the day, not so much during the night. And so overall, the differences in body weight and the increases in fat mass that we see in sedentary high protein fed mice is not related to increased food intake. If anything, they eat a little bit less and not really the result of, of big differences in activity either. Now, one of the other things that we can do with metabolic chambers is measure energy expenditure um, via indirect calorimetry. Essentially, we're measuring um, every couple minutes how much oxygen is going into the chamber and out of the chamber, um, and how much CO2 is going in and out of the chamber as well. And so as the animals um, metabolize fuel, burn fuel, if you will, um, they create more, carbon, more and more carbon dioxide, and we can use this to calculate how much energy um, they're burning at every uh, individual time point. And what we can see here is that the mice that are burning the most energy are those on a low protein diet. That's the black line here. Whereas mice that are eating the high protein diet, um, either the yellow line or the, the pinkish line, um, are actually burning less energy. If we plot this as a function of body weight, um, treating body weight as a covariate in an ANCOVA analysis, we could see that there's sort of two groups. Um, essentially, um, weight training doesn't really change energy expenditure in the resting state, um, but diet does. And so low protein fed mice have increased energy expenditure relative to high protein fed mice. Now, we did see some really great effects on um, muscle strength and muscle mass. So as you exercise, particularly as you are supplementing with dietary protein, um, athletes and bodybuilders believe that you build up big muscles. And we can see that here. Um, so in the FDL muscle, we see that a high protein diet uh, alone actually is sufficient um, to increase muscle mass. And this is potentiated even further by weight training. And so the mice that gain the most amount of um, big muscles, mu most muscle mass here, um, were those that were eating a high protein diet and weight training. This isn't true in every muscle. So in some mus muscles, we only saw a statistically significant increase um, in the high protein plus weight training group. Um, similarly, in the, both in the uh, soleus and the plantaris, you could see here um, that there is a difference um, not only uh, between high protein and high protein plus weight training, but also low protein plus weight training and high protein um, in the forearm flexor. But overall, this suggests that a lot of a sort of common knowledge, if you will, about protein uh, effect on as it relates to exercise in humans really carries over to mice. We see that the mice get bigger muscles um, if they're on a high protein diet, particularly if they're also exercising. Um, and we see these effects on body composition. Basically, athletes who are um, you know, eating protein supplements, for the most part, are metabolically healthy and they're not fat. And we see that exercise is protecting the mice from the effects of dietary protein on adipose composition. Here's another um, way to look at the effects on muscle mass. Here is um, the forearm. Um, and what we see is that, um, again, the biceps and the forearm um, both are potentiated in size um, by a high protein diet and particularly by the high protein um, diet in the presence of resistance exercise training. So the smallest um, muscles here in terms of diameter for the biceps in the forearm are those low protein fed animals. They're not exercising. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting is, is overall, low protein diet fed mice plus weight training 
doesn't really have really dramatic effects on um, muscle mass in most cases. So you really need that um, extra dietary protein. That doesn't quite turn out to be the case in terms of weight. So here's the maximum amount of weight that um, each animal could pull, or rather each group could pull over a course of 12 weeks of training. And you can see that consistently mice eating the high protein diet that are exercising can pull more weight than those that are on a low protein diet and weight training. But it actually only reaches statistical significance at one point. And by the end of 12 weeks, um, these two groups are largely uh, indistinguishable. And so while it suggests that high protein diet supplementation does help you gain strength faster, um, but at the end of time, um, you know, the two groups are essentially equivalent, even though the area on the curve can be quite different. Um, the number of sets is actually um, identical between these groups after uh, week three of training. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about how many repetitions they might be going down the track, um, it's very similar, uh, essentially identical between groups. So to conclude part one of this, um, we originally hypothesized that because in humans, we see that people who are exercising don't have bad metabolic consequences from dietary protein supplements or eating high protein diets, that resistance exercise would actually protect from the deleterious effects of a high protein diet. Um, we use metabolic chambers to show that low protein diets promote energy expenditure. Um, these mice actually eat more and burn off more energy, while well, mice eating a high protein di diet, if anything, actually eat less and burn less energy. And that high protein diet promotes fat mass accretion, particularly in sedentary mice, and resistance exercise protects from this. Um, and high protein diets, especially with resistance exercise, promotes muscle hypertrophy, just as um, it's believed to do in humans who are uh, consuming high protein diets or dietary protein supplements. And finally, one thing that's quite interesting is at least in these mice, low protein and high protein diets have relatively similar effects on strength um, if you do the exercise long enough, um, even in the absence of giant changes in um, muscle mass. So we're really interested in trying to figure out um, what could be some of the um, explanations there. We see do you see some differences in terms of fiber types between the various groups in these studies? Um, and it will also be very interesting to try and take this into other groups of animals and look at di dietary composition in more detail. So the second story I want to tell you today is one about um, what is it about protein restriction um, that uh, is good in terms of metabolic health? And there's a couple different ways to, to think about this. And the approach that we've followed up for a number of years now is focusing on the composition of dietary proteins, specifically its amino acids. So there are 20 common amino acids that are the building blocks of all proteins, and nine of these are essential, and the same nine are essential for both the human and mouse diet. And most of our work has focused on three amino acids in particular, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. These are called the branch chain amino acids, or BCAAs. Now, the BCAAs have been known to be really um, important metabolically for decades. So in the late 1960s, it was shown that these BCAAs are elevated in the blood of people with diabetes. And more recently, starting in the 1990s or so, people started investigating this in more detail. They found that um, obese and insulin-resistant humans, rats, mice models, um, and rat models of obesity um, are all have higher levels of branched chain amino acids in their blood. And in fact, uh, if you look at branched chain amino acid levels in the blood, they actually correlate very well with the level of glycated hemoglobin, which is a marker for um, glucose uh, tolerance and insulin sensitivity. Essentially, the higher your HbA1c, the worse your glucose control is, and your branched chain amino acids tend to be higher as well. And in a human study of protein restriction um, that we did with Luigi Fontana's laboratory at Washington University in St. Louis, we found that people who were protein restricted for six weeks, in addition to showing metabolic improvements, had lower blood levels of the three branched amino acids by about five to 10%. And that might not sound like a lot to you, but interestingly, the levels of the other amino acids in the blood don't really change in this group. So the BCAAs are uh, pretty much what's changing. So for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about um, amino acid defined diets. Um, and we have several different ones, a control diet, which matches sort of a standard mouse chow, 
where 21% of calories are coming from amino acids instead of um, protein. Low amino acid diet, where we're restricting dietary protein by 67%. Um, we've also tried lowering uh, the branched amino acid content, lowering the levels of all three BCAAs by two thirds, or lowering the levels of just one of the branched amino acids by two thirds. Now, when I say amino acids, these are literally the individual common amino acids mixed together in a big vat um, with the fat and sugar. And there's some major advantages, as I mentioned, to doing these types of studies in mice. This means that we can control everything. So all of the diets that you're going to show, see in each experiment are isocaloric, so they have the same energy density. The calories from fat and the sources of fat are completely constant. And whenever we remove one to three amino acids, so we've removed either one of the BCAAs or all three, we also keep them isonitrogenous. And we do this by just adding a little bit of the non-essential amino acids. And that also allows us to keep the carbohydrates completely the same um, between the diets as well. And so this is pretty much the best type of controlled experiment that you can do from a, a nutritional standpoint. Now, one of the things that we discovered right away is that protein restriction in mice, as well as branched amino acid restriction, have very similar effects on metabolism. Not identical, but similar. And so for instance, mice where we protein restrict um, or replace on a low AA diet have increased food intake. Um, and this is because dietary protein is satiating. Here we're cutting back protein by a lot and its food in increase, intake increases dramatically. Um, and we see, see very similar effects when mice are placed on a low BCA diet. Mice that are young, growing black six mice tend to gain less weight. So here over 10 weeks, these mice gain about six grams of weight, whereas these mice eating a low BCA diet only gain about two grams, and mice on the low AA diet essentially gain no weight over the course of that uh, time period. While both lean mass and fat mass are affected by this, overall fat mass is preferentially affected. And so protein-restricted mice or mice on this low AA diet as well as BCAA restricted animals have less are less have lower adiposity, um, less relative uh, percentage of their body is fat. And there are other changes as well. Here's a glucose tolerance test. I'll show you a number of these um, today. Basically, um, we take mice, we fast them, and uh, then over the course of about two hours, we see what happens to our blood glucose after glucose is administered at time zero. And basically, um, the larger the area under this curve, the worse the glucose tolerance. Um, diabetic mice and diabetic people will have a big area under the curve. While animals that have better improvements or have better glycemic control have a lower area under the curve. And you can see if we quantitate this, the low, low BCA and low AA diets, the protein restricted type of diet, have very similar effects on glucose tolerance. So we wanted to know um, which of the BCAs mediate the benefits of a low BCA diet. And we originally thought that um, some of these would be very similar, but over the past five, five to six years, it's become clear that individual BCAs actually have quite distinct metabolic effects as well as um, roles in metabolism. To do this, we took black six male mice and placed them on one of five different diets. Again, these are all isocaloric with the same fat and same carbohydrates. These are all isonitrogenous as well. The only thing that we're varying is we're reducing the levels of individual amino acids or all three BCAAs by 67%, two thirds relative to the control diet. And what we saw um, when we did this and looked at glucose tolerance was very dramatic differences um, between the animals. Um, so leucine actually surprisingly tended to have very minimal metabolic effects. You can see that in glucose tolerance, control and low leucine diets overlap completely. Low isoleucine diets, on the other hand, are really potent and had really dramatic benefits for glucose tolerance, vastly reducing the area under the curve. Um, and low valine and low BCA had sort of intermediate benefits. Um, overall, this is very consistent what we see, which is that there tend to be small benefits of restricting um, valine and quite large benefits of restricting isoleucine in the context of young black six mice. The effects on body composition also were the most dramatic in the isoleucine restricted animals. As in the case of, of BCAA restriction, there are effects on both lean mass and fat mass. 
But here you can see that the red uh, low isoleucine fed animals gain almost no fat mass over the course of uh, 12 weeks, so three months um, on that diet. Whereas all of the other groups um, continue to gain adipose mass, um, although the BCA mice, as we've seen previously, gain adipose mass at a reduced rate. Looking, of course, different um, other uh, readings of metabolic health in sort of a heat map format. Here are control A, um, mice are in the center, so they are a one-fold change. And you can see that isoleucine restriction, valine, and BCA restriction all have similar effects and are shifting things in the same direction when we look at all the different components of body composition and multiple different types of uh, glycemic control, including glucose, insulin, and pyruvate tolerance tests. Leucine, on the other hand, tends to shift things the other way. Mice actually tend to be a little bit fatter um, when we uh, restrict leucine in the diet. Their fat depots actually gained weight in uh, one of our uh, previous studies. Um, and so there definitely seems to be something quite different about leucine than the other two BCAAs, isoleucine and valine. Now, of course, we're really interested in understanding the physiological and molecular mechanisms behind these effects, right? Because not only from a scientific perspective, but this could help us um, develop drugs or other interventions that engage these mechanisms um, to promote uh, metabolic health. So one of the things that changes is um, glucose uh, tolerance and in particular uh, glucose uh, that's produced by the liver. And so um, we can use something called a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. And this is an experiment where um, isotopically labeled um, glucose, so essentially radioactive glucose, is infused into an animal. And by um, looking at um, the amount of glucose in the blood and the percentage of that that is radioactive, um, we can get a really good estimate of how much glucose is being produced endogenously. And the vast majority of glucose that's produced in the body of a mouse is produced by the liver. And so what we're able to see is that in basal conditions, essentially where um, there is just no, not, no um, insulin being delivered to the animal, we're not suppressing, trying to suppress glucose synthesis, we see that there's similar amounts of glucose production between control and low isoleucine fed mice. But under clamp conditions where there's high levels of insulin, then we're trying to really suppress endogenous uh, glucose production. We see that the control animals um, shut down about 25 to 30% of their hepatic glucose production with the dose of insulin we're using, whereas almost 80% is shut down in the isoleucine restricted animals. And so the livers of these mice are much more sensitive to insulin. In fact, we think this accounts for a lot of the benefits of a low isoleucine diet on glycemic control. Now, we took the livers of these animals and we performed transcriptomic profiling to try and get a sense of what types of molecular changes were uh, happening. And in this particular experiment, we didn't really gain too much insight into that, but we did notice one particular gene that was changing um, and that is called FGF21. And so FGF21 is a really interesting um, uh, protein. It was discovered um, over 20 years ago. Um, and overall, it does a lot of things. One of the things it does is it's an insulin sensitizing hormone um, produced in response to fasting. Um, it also is a key regulator of energy balance. And in work um, by Chris Morrison's lab, uh, it was shown that FGF21 is an endocrine signal of protein restriction. Um, and work that um, he and others have done since then has really built on this and shown that there's really um, quite a bit of um, beneficial effects uh, related to FGF21. Now, in isoleucine restriction, no one had ever particularly looked um, and at the effects of isoleucine restriction on FGF21, so we did. And what we found is that in multiple tissues, liver, inguinal white adipose tissue, and muscle, these are all tissues where FGF21 is normally produced, we can see a real in, a strong induction of the FGF21 mRNA um, in those tissues when we place mice on a low isoleucine diet. And this is reflective in the plasma as well. So plasma levels of FGF21 also rise. Now, one of the things that isoleucine does, which is quite, or FGF21 does, sorry, is very interesting, is that FGF21, um, primarily from the liver, travels to the brain and by action on the brain actually induces what's called the browning or beijing of white adipose tissue. 
And this is a state where your white adipose tissue, which is sort of metabolically inert and really used for storing lipids, storing energy, turns into an energy producing tissue that produces heat. Um, and the brown color is actually reflective of the fact that they have more mitochondria. Um, and we saw this sort of phenotype of these mice where the, um, the droplets in the uh, inguinal white adipose tissue are getting smaller. We see multilocular cells. And when we measure the expression of different thermogenic genes like UCP1, we see a strong induction in the case of a low isoleucine diet. And so a low isoleucine diet seems to promote um, browning and beijing of white adipose tissue. Now, beige and adipose tissue produces a lot of energy. It's metabolically active. And so we can measure that with metabolic chambers again. Um, and so here um, we measured uh, energy expenditure again by indirect calorimetry using our Columbus instrument cages. And we see that there's a real strong induction of energy expenditure in both the light and dark phase when we restrict isoleucine. And we actually see similar effects um, when we restrict either valine or low branched amino acids. So these seem to be um, quite key in regulating energy expenditure as well. Um, but again, leucine is quite distinct. Um, so leucine restriction does not have these benefits. Those animals look very similar um, to control fed mice or even have less energy expenditure. Now to test whether or not FGF21 was required for some of the effects of a low isoleucine diet, we use FGF21 knockout mice. Um, and so we bred these in the laboratory um, and we placed these on either a control diet or a low isoleucine diet. We also have litter mate, uh, litter mate controls um, that are wild. And so you can see that in the wild type mice, when we isoleucine restrict, we get a big increase in food consumption. And that's completely ablated um, when we look in the knockout mice. So this effect is entirely dependent on FGF21. And when we looked at energy expenditure in our metabolic chambers, we see that this effect is partially dependent on FGF21. We see a strong increase in energy expenditure in isoleucine restricted animals in both the light phase and the dark phase. It's higher in the dark phase, which is typical for nocturnal mice. And this is blunted in the FGF21 knockout mice, um, but it is still statistically higher during the dark phase in the FGF21 low isoleucine restricted animals than in the wild type, uh, or the FGF21 knockout animals on a control diet. And so you can see that magnitude is about 50%. So FGF21 is required for some of the metabolic effects of a low isoleucine diet. One thing it's not required for is the improvements in glucose tolerance. So that seems to be FGF21 dependent, independent. Now, finally, I'd like to tell you about a really interesting study that we have been working on lately, um, which is to try to understand whether restriction of isoleucine um, can promote healthy aging. And this is based on a variety of work, but includes a paper that um, we published in 2021, where we showed that if we took black six mice and we placed them on a low BCAA diet, um, when started very young, this was capable of extending lifespan quite dramatically in males by about 30% associated with other metabolic benefits as well. Um, but there are a number of reasons um, that that wasn't the, the best designed experiment. And so we tried to do a, a really good job um, here and focus on isoleucine. So some of the things that we did a little bit differently is here we're looking um, at both males and females of a mouse strain called HET3. And these are genetically heterogeneous animals. Um, essentially four different inbred lines um, are crossed in a defined pattern. And so each one of the F2 progeny of those mice is genetically unique, but the population overall can be reproduced at any time um, just by performing another set of breedings. Um, an advantage of this is that these types of animals are not susceptible to strain-specific causes of death. And so, for instance, rather than just dying like from primarily one or two cancers like a black six mouse does, this actually dies from a whole spectrum of different types of cancers as well as other age-associated pathologies. And we took these mice and we placed them on a, either a control diet, a low amino acid diet, or a low isoleucine diet. Again, these are all isocaloric um, with the same sources of fat. They're not isonitrogenous because we remove about two thirds of the nitrogen when we remove um, the amino acids. Um, but the control and low isoleucine diets are isonitrogenous and have identical carbohydrate levels and compositions as well. And finally, the last thing that we did was put these mice on this diet at six months of age. And so roughly speaking, that's probably equivalent to a 25 or 30 year old human. 
So fully grown, doesn't have any more developing to do. Um, and overall, um, you know, it can be a fully adult mouse and doesn't uh, mimic um, the effects of starting when the mice are really young, which is sort of when the mice might still be developing or, you know, e or, um, you know, still be childlike, if you will. So the first thing I want to show is uh, body weight over time. And interestingly enough, the effects are different between all of these groups. And you, you can see in both the males and the females, the control fed animals are the ones that weigh the most. And the low isoleucine fed animals are the ones that weigh the least. Um, and our low protein, low AA group um, is sort of in the middle for the most part. Now, just as in our um, previous studies, we wanted to see if these effects were due to changes in body composition. And so we measured fat mass and lean mass over time. I'm only presenting fat mass to you now, but there are definitely effects on lean mass as well. But these effect differences in body weights are largely explained by huge differences in fat mass. And so you can see that our low isoleucine fed mice, males, lose more than half of their fat mass um, in the three months after they are placed on the low isoleucine diet. Um, in the low case of the low A diet, it's about half that. And both males and more dramatically females on a control diet tend to continue to gain adipose mass with age. And that's largely blocked um, by a low A diet and completely blocked by the low isoleucine diets. And that seems to be true in both males and females. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that it's well known that calorie restriction extends lifespan. And so we were very interested in looking at calorie intake um, and looking at calorie intake at multiple times, indeed, um, says that this is not due to calorie restriction. So here they've been on the diet for about a month, and you can see that low AA and low isoleucine fed group, the orange and red here, or the dark red and orange here, um, actually have quite a significant increase in calorie intake relative to control fed mice. And that's true of both males and females. Now, because they're eating more, they're not necessarily eating 67% less protein or 67% less isoleucine, even though that's the change we made in the diet. And here, for instance, we can measure how their restriction of um, isoleucine. And you can see that um, the low AA and low isoleucine groups are eating about the same amount of isoleucine each day. Um, and that this is um, dramatically lower um, than the control fed animals. Now they're eating more and they're leaner and they're not gaining as much weight over time. In fact, if anything that, you know, they've lost a lot of fat mass um, pretty rapidly. And so this is, seems to be associated with increases in energy expenditure. Again, we used our Columbus Instrument metabolic cages. Here on the left, we're looking at the light cycle. Here on the other side, we're looking at the dark cycle. And in both in the light and the dark cycle, we see that the low isoleucine fed animals um, are the highest. They have the greatest energy expenditure, while the control fed animals have the lowest, and the low AA diets are sort of largely sort of intermediate. Um, in the case here, um, in the females during light phase, they're actually the, the highest, um, but uh, in the males, they are intermediate. And so both of these diets promote energy expenditure. Seems like uh, maybe the amount of energy expenditure and the amount of food uh, consumption they each induce um, is a little different between the groups. Um, but this probably goes a lot, long way towards explaining some of the differences in weight and body composition. If we track what happens to energy expenditure over time, this is very reflective of what we see. You can see that for the most part, um, the control diets are have the lowest energy expenditure over the course of a 24-hour cycle, whereas low AA and low isoleucine fed animals have more. Um, and depending on which uh, sex we're looking at, males or females, which one is actually higher in absolute terms tends to differ. Um, but there's definitely big differences um, between the low AA and the low isoleucine groups as well. Now, one of the nice things about lifespan studies is that we can take measurements at multiple times and see what happens as, as the animals get older. So here we actually measured energy expenditure at three different time points, 9, 14, and 24 months of age. And at all of these time points, we see a consistent story where energy expenditure is higher in mice that are fed a low AA or a low isoleucine diet. There's variation from time point to time point. Sometimes they're very similar, particularly during the light phase. Sometimes there's more of a difference. Sometimes there's less of a difference. But this seems to be a consistent story um, over time. 
We also looked at some other parameters. So um, respiratory exchange ratio, basically how much um, fat or carbohydrates the animals are burning. Um, again, um, we've previously shown that low isoleucine and low AA diets tend to um, increase RER. Um, and this reflects um, greater utilization of carbohydrates. Um, we, for the most part, don't see that in the males, although there are some trends in that direction. Um, it reaches statistical significance at one time point in the females, um, where you can see that these groups have increased RER um, relative to control mice. Um, we don't really see changes in activity. And so just as in um, some of our previous experiments and our experiments with weight training, we don't think that the differences in activity um, uh, contribute to the differences in weight between the groups. So we performed glucose tolerance tests at multiple times. Here's one that's per, uh, done at seven months of age after the mice have been on the diets for about one month. And you can see that both a low AA and a low isoleucine diet improve glucose tolerance in both sexes, although um, there's differences in the degree in response um, in the males. In the females, the effect of the low AA and low isoleucine diets completely overlap. Um, in the case of older mice, though, what we actually see is that only the low isoleucine diet has improvements in glucose tolerance. And so the benefits for the low AFED mice um, as it relates to glycemic control seem to go away. And in fact, they have different effects on glucose tolerance when the animals are old. One of the things that we did was transcriptomics, metabolomics, and lipidomics profiling on the livers of these mice, or, or rather a section, a cross-sectional cohort of these mice um, that we sacrificed um, in order to do molecular uh, profiling. Now, one thing that's quite interesting, here we're looking at young black six males, is that there's a lot of similarity um, between low AA and low isoleucine fed animals. And this was what we originally expected to see across the board. Um, here you can see that more than half of the genes that are changed in low isoleucine fed mice are also changed in low AA fed mice, suggesting that isoleucine really drives a lot of the effects of it in this process. Um, but in old um, mice, this actually turns out not to be the truth. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity between the animals, and there are actually zero genes that are significantly affected in both low AA and low isoleucine fed mice, aged males. In females, the entire thing is flipped. So in the young mice, there's very little overlap between the, the effects of each diet on gene expression. Um, but in the old mice, we see something that's very similar to the young males. So the old females have, um, roughly speaking, about half of the genes, a little less than half of the genes that are changed by low AA diet are also changed by low isoleucine diet. And so there are both age and sex-dependent effects of diet um, on the hepatic transcriptome. Now, uh, one of the drawbacks of using these genetically heterogeneous mice is it's quite difficult to test directly things like whether FGF21 is involved in the response. And so we weren't able to do that, but we did find that FGF21 levels in the blood, um, as well as hepatic expression of FGF21, largely seem to not correlate um, with the metabolic benefits that we see. So you could see in both young and old mice, um, looking regardless of diet or sex, um, there's no statistically significant differences um, in FGF21 expression. There is a trend towards increased levels of FGF21 um, in low AA and low ILE fed males, both in circulating and in the mRNA, um, that we don't see um, in the females. So there is the possibility that FGF21 um, has some effects in the males, but um, that remains uh, to be determined and certainly not clear cut. One of the other things we can do in mice um, is measure frailty. And so this is based on a fra clinical frailty index for mice developed by Susan Hallett and colleagues at Dale House University in Canada. And basically we score the mice um, every couple of months on a list of different factors. And these are all different deficits that accumulate with age. For instance, hair loss, um, grooming, gait, whether or not the tail um, responds with a good reflex wrapping around your finger when you touch the base of the tail, or it only responds part way, or it doesn't respond at all. And by doing this and scoring these uh, blindly on mice, we can get a very good sense of what's happening with frailty with age. And so you can see that in both males and females, the control fat animals have an age associated increase in frailty that we expect. Um, but that's largely tends to be blunted by low AA and low isoleucine diets. 
And so in both males and females, the frailty over time, um, as well as at specific time points, is lower in mice on the restricted diets. This tends not to be the case for the females, um, except uh, you can see here at 24 months of age. Now, we can measure um, other aspects of frailty uh, as well. So one thing we can do is measure rotor rod performance. Um, and this is an instrument that we obtained from Columbus Instruments. It's essentially a running um, log. You put the mice on this rotating rod, rod that's accelerating over time. And eventually, the animal is not going to be able to maintain its balance anymore um, and is going to fall off. And so um, people were very interested when we were discussing some of uh, our studies if low AA or low isoleucine diets tended to compromise muscle health. And I think I can convince you from the first story that we showed that that's not the case for protein restriction. Here in aged mice, though, we see um, that rotor rod performance is actually, if anything, better in low isoleucine fed animals um, than in control fed mice. And so um, both rotor rod testing and another way of testing um, strength, which is in bird and cling, we could see that overall um, the animals have normal or potentially even better um, physical fitness when they're on a restricted diet. We also measure um, longevity. That was the, the whole point of this um, experiment to begin with. And we found that um, particularly in males, but also in females, low isoleucine diet extends lifespan. Um, and there's a couple of interesting things here. So first of all, we see a major extension in male lifespan. It's much greater than in females, but females did have a statistically significant increase in lifespan on a low isoleucine diet. And interestingly enough, a low AA diet or protein restricted diet, which many groups, including our own, has shown works in young black six mice, um, does not extend lifespan um, in HET3 mice when begun at six months of age. And so whether that's related to the genotype, whether that's related to um, the age of initiation of diet start, that remains to be determined. But we're really interested in trying to figure that out. Finally, we recently came up with a new way of um, measuring health span, um, which is um, essentially the effect of the health of an individual animal measured over time, um, where one it's super healthy year of life, where your maximum health um, is essentially uh, equal to a value of one. And if you're in poor health, that year of life might be um, anywhere less than one, um, between zero and one. And what we see um, using this new measure that we um, have published online, how to generate, because called, we've called it rail, we can see that low isoleucine fed males, have, of course, um, have this extension lifespan with an equivalent improvement in the health span. But actually, females have the same improvements in health span that males do. Um, and so even though they're only living a little bit longer, they're living much healthier. Um, and interestingly, our protein restricted group, um, we do see an improvement in health span um, in the females that's statistically significant. And it's almost equivalent to the effects of a low isoleucine diet in females. So um, that is something to think about going forward because you know, the absolute number of years you live may not be as important as the number of healthy years um, that you're able to enjoy. Finally, people are really interested in whether this applies to humans, and we're really interested in trying to figure that out. Um, working with uh, the Survey of Health of Wisconsin, which is an uh, epidemiological group, we found that um, in people in Wisconsin, dietary intake of isoleucine is associated with BMI. And so if you tended to eat lower amount, lo foods with lower amounts of, of isoleucine, like emu or potentially turkey, um, you tended to have a lower BMI than people who had uh, more of their protein consumed in the form of isoleucine. And a study um, conducted a number of years ago in 2019 um, showed that if you um, use a machine learning approach to try and predict blood factors that um, are associated with longevity, isoleucine is actually the only uh, branched amino acid that's negatively correlated with longevity. So the more isoleucine in your blood, the more likely you um, were to die in the study of 44,000 people. So in conclusion, restricting all three dietary BCAAs or isoleucine alone um, can really improve metabolic health, particularly in young C57 black 6 j males. There are age, diet, and sex-dependent metabolic and molecular effects of both isoleucine and um, amino acid slash protein restriction. And our main finding here um, in part two is that isoleucine restriction starting at six months of age has really big benefits, metabolic health, frailty, and the lifespan 
of genetically heterogeneous HET3 mice that may um, sort of in some ways reflect the genetic heterogeneity of the human population. Um, we see that restricting all amino acids promotes health span, even though it doesn't promote lifespan um, in females. And there's at least some evidence that isoleucine um, may play similar roles in humans, um, being negatively associated with body mass index and uh, survival um, in people. I'd like to thank everyone in our lab who participated in these experiments. Um, in particular, Michaela Murphy led the exercise experiments with Leigh Broucher. Um, and Kara Green led the lifespan experiments. Um, Charles and, and Nicole contributed to identifying isoleucine as a key metabolic regulator in, uh, in the first place. I'd like to thank all of our funding sources, particularly the NIA, um, and uh, which has really supported us uh, quite generously in these experiments, all of our great collaborators um, at the University of Wisconsin and elsewhere, particularly Troy Hornberger, who came up with the um, resistance exercise model um, for mice, and um, thank you for your attention. Are you ready to join us for the Q&A here? Yes, absolutely. OK, thank wonderful. You. Yes, thank you for that uh, the fantastic presentation. Um, maybe we can start with a, a question that we had. Uh, there's a number of questions on the registration form, and some have come in now during the presentation. What are some of the common sources of dietary isoleucine? What foods have the highest isoleucine content, et cetera? I know you mentioned emu and, uh, and turkey there. So uh, everything has pretty much, uh, pretty much everything has uh, branched chain amino acids and specifically uh, isoleucine. Um, so it, it's pretty difficult to, you know, think about cutting um, isoleucine uh, massively in the diet. But in terms of, you know, the normal range, uh, it seems like beef and pork tend to be at the higher range of meat, major meats, um, whereas turkey seems to definitely be the lowest uh, of the meats. Um, interestingly, um, in the USDA food database, the highest food um, in terms of its uh, isoleucine content um, is uh, uh, pork containing uh, bratwurst. So um, that might be um, something to avoid if, uh, if these results apply to humans. A, a, a Midwestern uh, specialty, I think, it, for, for someone from Wisconsin, from what I understand. Well, well, beef uh, bratwurst seems to be fine. So, you know, Interesting. so okay. there, there are some choices. Uh, another common question we've had is how do these observations uh, in mice, uh, how might they translate to humans? I know you mentioned that to some extent as well. Uh, you know, and, and a, another question mentions um, whether or not the metabolic pathways and aging processes are similar amongst the two. Um, well, you know, overall, there's definitely uh, differences between species, and, and, you know, that is something that we always have to be conscious of when we think about these types of studies. Um, but there is a lot of similarity, and many different molecular pathways are um, modulated similarly in mice and humans. Um, and mice tend to be um, fairly good models for uh, diabetes and obesity research as well. Um, suggesting that a lot of the same pathways that we see here in terms of its regulation of glycemic control and adiposity um, may also be conserved. So, of course, you know, not everything in mice translates directly to humans, but um, at the molecular level, many similar pathways are engaged. Um, and the processing of branched amino acids is identical in mice and humans. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question here as well. Uh, is there a difference in caloric intake between the low protein and high protein groups if you express it per mouse? the same way uh, energy expenditure is presented. Yeah, so um, overall food consumption tends to go up. Um, it goes up even more when you normalize it to a body weight, but on the individual animal level as well. Um, what's really interesting is that these animals are eating more food um, despite on a low protein diet, despite living longer and being in better health. Um, and so, you know, that relationship between food intake and energy expenditure, we think, you know, that those are uh, sort of driving each other, um, that, uh, you know, the, the animals are eating more probably because they're burning more energy off. Um, but uh, food consumption overall on a per animal basis also goes up. Right. There, there was a question here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this study or not, but the, the, a question about the National Institute of Aging rhesus monkey experiment of calorie restriction uh, failed to show any benefit of calorie restriction for life extension. Could you comment on that at all? Yeah. So um, there's a 2014 Nature Communications paper that was jointly published by the NIA group and the University of Wisconsin study, which did see a lifespan effect. 
Um, and, you know, basically that article um, suggests that overall calorie restriction does work in rhesus macaques um, and that various artifactual regions contributed to some of um, that uh, issue, basically uh, um, exactly how much the control animals were being fed and maybe how many times a day they were being fed. I see. Okay, fantastic. Um, fat or carbs added to the low protein diet should be a very important factor. How is your formulation done? And what is the metabolic role of the replacement component in your first study? So um, in our original studies, we actually keep, uh, in, in basically all of our studies, we keep um, fat source um, and uh, amount uh, consistent between the diets. So they're, they're completely matched. Um, in our low protein diet, we can't keep it isonitrogenous, right? We have to take amino acids out of the diet. And so there we're substituting in carbohydrates, which is really interesting, right? Because, you know, when we're told thinking about from the diabetes and obesity perspective, we think that carbohydrates are bad, yet here these mice are eating a high carbohydrate diet, um, yet they are metabolically healthier. Um, and um, in other studies that I didn't show when we when we do this in the context of Western diet, we can even replace it with sort of um, high calorie, high sucrose diets and pump in more sucrose. Um, and still the mice are able to be metabolically healthier due to the low protein. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, in the case of the isoleucine um, or specific amino acid diets, when we're just replacing um, some of one amino acid, we keep it isonitrogenous by proportionally increasing non-essential amino acids. So carbohydrates also don't change in those studies. Okay, fantastic answer. Um, a little bit along those lines then, how does body composition, such as fat percentage, um, muscle mass, etc., impact amino acid absorption along with the dietary levels of isoleucine? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I wouldn't expect it to impact um, amino acid absorption at all. Um, certainly there is gonna be some change, there certainly could be some changes in um, processing in the gut though, I would say. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of other interventions, generally speaking, um, all restrictions seem to induce compensatory changes where the body tries to extract more um, nutrients from food. So calorie restriction, the intestine gets longer, the villi surface area increases, and actually caloric um, uptake actually from the gut increases in those cases. We would expect that probably that would be the case in the case of branched chain amino acid um, or isoleucine restriction as well, although um, we don't formally know that. Um, it's pretty difficult to um, measure uh, blood levels, uh, blood amino acid levels in the portal vein, although some people have managed to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the actual changes in the gut themselves are going to be impacted by microbiota differences as well. So it's pretty difficult to, to answer that um, entirely, but I'd expect that probably more amino acids would probably be absorbed. Okay, fantastic. Uh, if you have a, we, we're just, we're at time here, but if you have a few more minutes, if we could try and knock out a few more questions. Sure, definitely. Okay, wonderful. And uh, if you do have to leave, please send in your questions. You can send them on the survey, add them now, and we will forward them on to Dudley as well after the talk, and we'll get through as many as we can here. Um, here's a great question uh, regarding the known loss of muscle mass in aging. How do you reconcile your observations with recommendations to increase protein intake in the elderly? Well, that's a really interesting question. That's one of the things that we're sort of uh, looking into now. Um, and, you know, I think there, there's some really good questions about how age uh, is going to impact these different uh, dietary effects and whether or not these interventions will work or actually be deleterious um, if initiated in old age, right? Because it's definitely the case that people who are elderly tend to suffer from sarcopenia and mus age-related muscle loss. And if anything, we need to not increase that, right? We want to fight that uh, age-related muscle loss to keep people uh, fit and healthy. Um, some of our preliminary research actually suggests that um, low-protein diets are not particularly del deleterious in that case, but actually that high-protein diets could actually be a little bit deleterious. And so we're trying to dig into that and see, um, you know, what types of diets are best at what ages. So that, that's a really important question. I suppose it's not an entirely binary uh, scenario in, in all cases, right? I think so. And I think, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see exactly where those age cutoffs might be uh, in mice and then see if we can move those findings to people. Right. Fantastic. Uh, great question, I think, based on your work. is there, Are there any edible collators for isoleucine, for example? Is that something that's feasible? Um, you know, that that's an interesting question. I haven't heard that exact one before. 
Um, you know, definitely there is some uh, data suggesting that people who have microbiota that um, tend to take up more branched chain amino acids from the gut um, might have a lower rates of obesity. And so definitely, you know, doing something in the gut, be it with microbiota or if they existed, chemical chelators um, could definitely be one way to reduce the amount of isolution that somebody's eating. Fantastic. Uh, any uh, comments on, on vegetarians or vegan diets uh, and how that might factor in here? Um, so it turns out that, that vegetarian diets um, actually are not particularly low in um, uh, isoleucine, although vegan diets um, could be. And so it seems like of um, relative to the amount of protein, um, uh, fruits actually contain some of the lowest amounts of isoleucine. But of course, fruits are also low in protein. Um, and so uh, vegans are probably, for the most part, already eating a low-protein diet, um, even if isoleucine might be relatively more uh, decreased. Okay, fantastic. Um, maybe we can uh, finish up with one or two more quick ones here. Um, why would lower isoleucine, or why did I, uh, lowering isoleucine only seemingly show improved metabolic health among the three branch chain amino acids? Do you have uh, some indication of why that's the case? Um, I think the an the answer is that is the jury's still out. They definitely have um, different metabolic effects. Um, one of our collaborators, Chol Soon Yang, had shown that uh, valine catabolite actually circulates in the blood and regulates um, fatty acid uptake into endothelial tissues. Um, leucine definitely has some really um, different effects. And looking at the molecular level, we see that um, each of the three branched amino acids has different molecular impacts, um, in, in, at least in the liver, on gene expression, on transcript, on um, the epigenome, on metabolites. And so they seem to be very, very distinct, even though they are processed very similarly. Um, and they do wind up in different catabolites. So leucine is exclusively catabolized to essentially acetyl-CoA, while isoleucine is catabolized to both acetyl-CoA and propanyl-CoA. So there's definitely a difference in the metabolites um, that they end up in. Um, there may be some other differences as well. Okay, wonderful. I let, maybe we'll make this the last question. Um, rest assured, we'll forward all your questions on to Dudley uh, after the talk and keep sending them in, please. Um, and thank you for all of them. They've been fa some fantastic ones. Can exercise change the isoleucine-mediated effects, or is there any way to reduce the deleterious effects of isoleucine? I mean, I think based on our you know protein study, we would expect that um, p resistance exercise would probably reduce the um, negative effects of branched amino acids overall, um, and that could include isoleucine. Um, but since we've definitely seen that, you know, there are some different roles of different amino acids, I wouldn't like to suggest that that's the only one or, or gonna be the um, only effect. Um, and so that's something that we definitely need to look into further. So great question. Okay, yeah, thank you to everyone. There's been some fantastic questions. They're still coming in, um, but unfortunately I think that'll be the last question for today. Uh, Dudley, I really wanted to thank you for your time and uh, expertise today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Um, great questions, Andrew. Thank you so much for running this. And uh, thanks to Columbus Instruments as well for uh, sponsoring this and uh, helping us uh, with all of our various uh, questions about energy balance over the years. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Dudley. Um, and in closing, we hope you enjoyed this Insight Scientific webinar sponsored by Columbus Instruments. And we hope to see you with us again next time. Thank you, everyone.